so what is all the fuss about uh, with blockchain and cryptocurrency you know is it uh, is it a major thing is it a little thing is it uh, um uh, is, is it something that's uh, going to be absolutely critical for your future? And I think that, you know, as with all these things, it's a bit of bit of everything. Um, but one thing I want to sort of make a point right at the beginning is that uh, crypto cryptocurrencies and blockchain are not the same thing. Although cryptocurrencies uh, so far all are built on blockchains, uh, blockchain does not depend on is, isn't uh, in, dependent on cryptocurrencies so they're not the same thing you have to think about them separately and they will have different impacts on your business and your personal life uh, so just putting that putting that out there um, and I like to um, oh, can oh, right let's try that okay um, I like to start with a with a hypothesis um, and um, the idea is that um, you may not agree with the hypothesis. Um, I've had many occasions when I've given presentations when people haven't agreed with the hypothesis, but at least then you can understand the context of all the following slides because you can see where I'm going. So um, as I like analogies, I've done, said that uh, the blockchain can be compared to uh, transiting a black hole. Um, so you're going through the event horizon of a black hole. Now. Um, obviously, you know, it's it's uh, nobody's done it and come back to tell the tale. And in fact, you can't come back and tell the tale because you're in a different universe and the rules are all different there. Um, and there have been a number of occasions when there have been sort of fundamental sort of flip flops in, in, in the markets that have uh, got rid of complete industries. So uh, if you were in the livery stable business before the uh, before the uh, advent of the automobile, uh, you will find that uh, following that event horizon, there is no demand for your uh, for your products and services so um and uh, some years ago i gave a presentation in london to a telco audience about saying that the market for for telcos was going to go from being um supply limited to demand limited and that would constitute an event horizon and um a lot of people uh, were quite cynical about that uh, finding but some of them aren't laughing now um so this hypothesis is about blockchain um, and what it says is that it's going to be very different the other side of this and it's closer than we currently think um, so the um, it's probably not a good idea to spend your time thinking who's going to win and who's not going to win it's really better to be agile um, make sure you're aware of what's happening and uh, respond to it as quickly as you can and if something comes up that doesn't fit with your world vision then you need to adjust very quickly because it's uh, it's going to have a lot of momentum behind it um, we're currently uh, undergoing the fourth industrial revolution um, apparently uh, the, the dates of these revolutions uh, i've got written down here the first revolution was in 1784 uh, second in 1870, third in 1969, which is maybe a little more arbitrary. Fourth is even more arbitrary because it's difficult, difficult to get people to uh, specify a start date. So I've chosen 2010 because it was sort of 10 years after the dot-com bubble burst and things were getting back on to uh, track. But what you'll see is that the length of time between uh, revolution is, um, is actually reducing. And uh, so maybe the fifth Industry five might come in, uh, you know, in a 30 year time frame. So that could be by 2040, um, you know, less than 20 years from now. Um, and already uh, I got from the BBC News this morning, a third of economic activity is consumer spending. So we've already switched from a, a, a manufacturing focus and a land agricultural focus to a, a consumer spending focus in our economies and society. And I think industry five, who knows what it'll be, but you know, it might include quantum computing. It could complete include almost complete depopulation of the uh, workforce from industry so it'll be autonomous industry um, leisure spending would be um, paramount the majority the majority of the economy would be selling experiences and digital purchases so there won't necessarily be much sale of things um, and maybe we we won't own assets but just parts of assets just time timeshares or we'll just borrow what we need when we need it um, so if we go on to look at transactions and wealth, one of the things about each of those industry uh, revolutions, industrial revolutions, is that they enable a, 
almost a, a, an order of magnitude increase in the number of transactions that can take place in society. And I've defined a transaction as a movement of goods, information or value. Um, so in the first industrial revolution, people left the land and they went to congregate in cities um, and that gave a lot of opportunities. So they were close to each other so they could uh, transact between each other much more easily than if they were all out uh, in fields picking potatoes or cutting corn. Um, and the uh, growth of services to, to supply those people because they're not working on the land, um, they're, they're working in, uh, uh, in more um, industrial units and uh, being more um, uh, uh, and actually buying meals and so on and so forth so you get a growth of the service sector and all of that increases the the wealth of society post the first industrial revolution uh, the second industrial revolution when we get mass production and uh, our friend henry ford and stuff introduces um, production lines and we have electricity so that you don't have to stop working or studying when it gets dark uh, you can work through the night and so on have 24-hour shifts all that sort of stuff um, again facilitates a massive increase in in productivity and wealth generation um, the third industrial revolution uh, comes along with automation and um, there were predictions at the time that uh, there'd be mass unemployment of uh, you know because people wouldn't need um, typing pools in offices anymore and all that sort of stuff but actually what happened was that many of these boring and low paid low value add jobs got replaced with uh, more value add jobs like uh, being a programmer or an analyst or something um, so uh, in, in fact again we had a, a massive increase in uh, in in wealth in society and the um, and that the, uh, the the people within that society became more affluent and uh, spent more money and moved more of their spending towards consumer spending. And then with the fourth, uh, we have the rise of e-commerce, um, 24 by 7 availability, uh, more time poor people with better incomes than, than we'd ever seen before. And the world is local. Uh, I was telling Martin just a, a few minutes ago about an experience I had back in the 90s when I uh, when I bought a, a video from a company in New Zealand that had been identified to me in a newsletter I had from the USA. So my uh, my purchase transaction went via the USA, uh, was referred to New Zealand and within 24 hours I had this uh, VHS, as it happened, the video cassette of the World Gliding Championships. Yeah, I'm in, I'm, I'm, I'm in the herd. Um, uh, coming coming to me uh, through a, 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 what to me at that time was an astonishing um, sequence of events that probably couldn't have taken place much before then, um, but is now completely commonplace. You know, we buy our products and services from all over the world now without so much as a second thought. Uh, and we have much better security systems in terms of protecting our credit card numbers as well. Um, so anyway, so um, it may be that the demand for transactions and the wealth they generate could be infinite in society. So as long as you make more transactions available, then that demand demand will grow to, uh, to, to, to em embrace that. And with that thought, let's move on to uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. First of all, what are they? Um, this is just a very high level um, couple of uh, slides here. Um, so cryptocurrency is as uh, explained uh, it's a uh, a means of transferring value between parties um, the value is stored in something called a blockchain and the blockchain provides the means by which you can trust party a to meet the conditions that party b has required um, and uh, therefore transfer the money and so on and so forth um, uh, it's a, a a comparison I use a lot of the time, but you know, if you've ever bought a uh, car off a chap in the pub, <laughs> you probably found that uh, it wasn't quite as uh, quite as good as uh, he was telling you it was when when he sold it to you. Um, the blockchain actually helps to provide some sort of degree of uh, of security in making such uh, um, non mediated. Uh, transactions between people. So there are actually um, four different types of cryptocurrency. Um, the original Bitcoin, uh, which is the largest, is, has the proof of work as the means by which it engenders trust. And you can see how the blockchain works on the bottom of that uh, one side of that slide, whereby the transaction is broadcast to the whole of the of the peer-to-peer -peer network, which is everybody that exists 
who is part of that blockchain um, and then pe uh, people work to verify that transaction uh, by using many algorithms to produce a, a check block effectively at the end of the block and once that is accepted it's combined with the other transactions and shoved on the back of the as, as another block in the chain um, and it then cannot that, that block cannot then be altered um, because if you alter it then it won't agree with the algorithms and so therefore uh, anything that's happened is is um, is set in concrete unless in fact um, more than 50 percent of the nodes are owned by a single actor in which case they can make amendments as they see fit so if anybody ever really uh, corners the whole of the bitcoin market um, then uh, that, that could be a problem the trouble with that is that it's extremely processor intensive um, i've got something on the next slide about that um, but uh, the proof of stake bitcoin uh, uh, cryptocurrency actually um, breaks up the validation process to a number of smaller subsets uh, and that makes the processing load a lot better um, except that um, it also means that if somebody owns a majority of the of the uh, or a large proportion of the of the groups uh, validating um, validating the transactions again they can have um, uh, high levels influence on what goes on the next level is tokens uh, I like to think of those as being like Disney dollars you know that they, they sell you on them on the way into the park and you say uh, and they say oh yeah you can use these anywhere and then you get through that it's like a Simpsons episode where you get through the door and everyone says we do not accept Disney dollars <laughs> but and that's the problem with tokens is that they're not exchangeable for uh, ordinary currencies you can only exchange them for uh, cryptocurrencies and the fourth and uh, most um, uh, secure um, in terms of its ongoing valuation is stable coins and these are tied to a fiat currency so we've got um, tether for example uh, which is both a token and a stable coin um, and it's tied to the dollar and it's the raison d'etre is to actually maintain parity with the value of the dollar so you're not going to make a fortune but you're also not going to lose a fortune on it so it's a more secure means of, uh, of transacting um, there's uh, all sorts of horror stories about people losing value through um, through uh, um, the, the, the fluctuations or losing their hard disk or whatever uh, but I won't go into all those at the moment um, but basically that's it so blockchain and cryptocurrencies the blockchain is the foundation foundation technology that is uh, uses processes and uh, IT to basically um, provide a means by which uh, you can uh, run a cryptocurrency um, so in a nutshell um, the blockchain is what's called a distributed ledger what that means is that everybody who's participating in that blockchain has a copy of the ledger it doesn't exist in the bank of england or unless the bank of england is a participant uh, it doesn't go through any clearing process um, the trust is critical um, and the distribution of ledgers does create this huge uh, processing overhead um, there's also um, a lot about uh, you know the the, the processing is so intensive that uh, people are putting um, uh, Bitcoin mines mines in Greenland so that they don't have to spend so much on air conditioning to keep the to keep the servers cool. Um, and uh, on the next slide, there's a there's a picture which uh, hopefully will entertain you. Um, so the um, cryptocurrencies are the means by which they transfer the value. The clearing entity doesn't is not involved. Uh, and that makes banks fairly suspicious and governments fairly suspicious apart from anything else banks and governments are fairly suspicious because they just don't get to have a share of what's going on um, so that uh, there is this belief that uh, blockchain the blockchain cannot be hacked or decrypted um, and that's encouraged a lot of illegal use uh, whether it's drugs or people trafficking or weapons or whatever uh, and probably mostly tax fraud in that people aren't declaring their earnings um, but um, it also means that uh, like with cash if with no clearing entity there's no central record of what you've got and haven't got so if you lose it it's gone um, and the cryptocurrencies are evolving and we've got things like the stable coins that I've already mentioned there um, so now the next few slides are just going to 
provide some significant numbers, which I think will give you some context for how big this thing is. Um, this is uh, my estimate that clearing costs in the UK economy are likely to be greater than $20 billion per year. Um, this is uh, based on not just my, not just my uh, pulled out guess, but some numbers that I, that I had a look at. Um, but, uh, and according to the World Bank, you can see down here, remittance fees are 7.5% for consumers and 10% for commercial entities. You know, and uh, when you take the, uh, the, the size of the UK economy, then you can see how that, uh, how that uh, maps out. Airbnb has a 66.7% gross margin. Uh, it's a lot easier to make uh, a big margin if you don't actually have to own the uh, rooms that you're letting out. Um, so uh, I, I get a bit annoyed with the term the sharing economy because it's not really a sharing economy. It's a concentration of wealth in the hands of the, corp uh, the clearing companies' uh, um, economy. Uh, Uber is the same principle. It doesn't own the assets, but it sells them at uh, pretty much the same price as people that do own the assets have to sell them at. Um, and of course, Amazon famously um, had declared profits of 102 million pounds in the UK in 2020. Uh, it probably made uh, around 4 billion in the UK. That's that's my estimate based on 15% clearing margin. Uh, if you look at Airbnb's uh, margin, I suspect uh, Amazon might be making a lot more than 15%. So you can multiply that number by whatever you like, really. Um, and the processing requirements, this picture down at the right on the uh, bottom of the slide here is a Malaysian uh, police actually crushing over a thousand servers because um, there was a Bitcoin um, mine in the uh, in the country and it was stealing electricity and causing electricity outages throughout the country. So they went and uh, basically steamrolled all the uh, all the all the um, IT just to make sure they couldn't do it anymore. And according to the Chinese Academy of Sciences, it's 296.59 terawatt hours of electricity um, in uh, 2024. Um, so, uh, and, and it's only gonna get worse in a sense because um, the, um, the, the power available um, is improving, but uh, as the, uh, as the Bitcoin and the, sorry, not the Bitcoin, as the blockchain becomes ubiquitous, then the amount of processing that's going to be ne needed to process it all is, is just going to go up um, by orders of magnitude. So we've got a, an issue here, I think, that, uh, that, that needs to be dealt with. Um, just a quick look at the top cryptocurrencies. Um, the top three alone, alone are, have a market capitalization of over a trillion dollars. Bitcoin by far and away the largest. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto, Nakamoto is um, uh, widely believed to not be a real name. Um, nobody uh, officially knows who, uh, who invented Bitcoin. Um, five years ago, it was worth about $500 for a coin. It's now worth, in June 2021, over 32,000. Um, so 6,300% growth over five years. Ethereum is the second largest. Um, and uh, this is quite interesting because it's got smart contracts built into the blockchain that support Ethereum and that there, there may be a lot of them. Um, uh, so we've seen stuff about non-fungible tokens, NFTs in recent time. The first Twitter tweet got sold, didn't it, for uh, several million uh, and works of art and so on and so forth have been, uh, have been, um, uh, have been um, sold via NFTs. Um, and so all of that smart contract thing is, is quite important. Tether, which I already mentioned very briefly, is a stable coin, uh, which is backed, uh, stable coin means it's backed by a fiat currency. Um, and uh, the Tether is tethered to the US dollar, funnily enough. Uh, Binance coin is number four, and that's also um, a crypto exchange, one of the recommended ones. In fact, uh, Forbes advises it that is the uh, as the best overall exchange. I think with Coinbase being the uh, exchange with the the next uh, that's best for beginners. Um, then there's a couple more here: Cardano and Dogecoin. Dogecoin. I went down to number six because um, uh, Dogecoin was um, started actually as a joke. Um, but uh, you've, if you look at uh, Binance Coin, that's got a three hundred and fifty thousand percent growth and uh, dogecoin 159,900 increase in value so they are um they have been uh, obviously you know none of them aren't um 
aren't providing uh, large returns um, if, if you can use them, uh, unless you got in late, uh, in which case uh, you're, you're losing money. <laughs> um, mentioning their names, Martin. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> no worries. Um, so uh, the importance of blockchain. Um, according to PricewaterhouseCoopers in October 2020, the impact of blockchain will be a 57 billion pound boost to the UK economy by 2030. That's quite a lot of money. Uh, and the global economy could see a $1.7 trillion boost. Um, and the tipping point for blockchain is forecast as 2025. So, you know, that's, um, that's three and a half years from now. Um, scale adoption is going to be expected across the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, it could happen before that, a year or two before that. Um, so the areas where... Um, blockchain really, really adds value is um, in provenance. Uh, it's tracking and tracing. Um, if only the government had used, track, uh, used blockchain for its track and trace system, maybe we'd be better off and we'd be further along down our blockchain journey. Um, so uh, tracking and tracing products uh, al along value chains, um, field to plate from agricultural products, um, you know, for drug companies from where they get their ingredients to the eventual prescription and so on and so forth uh, the blockchain can provide a very secure method of, um, of of being sure of what the provenance of a particular product is and uh, managing the the supply chain effectively and that's going to be the largest impact 30 billion pounds it's forecast there uh, payments and financial services including the use of digital currencies is less than half that amount um, but it's significant nonetheless uh, and identity management, identity, you know, security and uh, so on is absolutely critical, more and more critical. The more digital we become, the more we need our digital IDs to be secure and, uh, and perfect. Um, and blockchain provides uh, uh, the best mechanism yet for that sort of level of uh, security. Um, so the application of blockchain in contracts and dispute resolution, they say, is a three billion boost. Given that um, Ethereum and other blockchains uh, and, and cryptocurrencies that have come along since build smart contracts into the blockchain itself. What that means is that all those uh, services that you perhaps normally go to a lawyer for uh, might actually be built into the software uh, baked in. So, uh, you know, that, that's a big impact. If you're a lawyer, uh, legal firm, you need to be thinking about that now because you know, a big proportion of your business might not, might not, be, uh, might not be viable in the future. Um, so uh, number four, just some examples of people who are already using uh, blockchain. We've got, I think, 50 companies on here or thereabouts. Uh, just a couple of examples from there. Uh, Barclays is using blockchain technology um, to streamline fund transfers and for its know your customer uh, processes. Uh, it's already filed for certain patents in that area. Visa actually introduced a blockchain as far as long ago as 2016. Um, I say introduced was piloting it. Uh, it's taken some time to get it live, but by the end of 2019, it was expressing a wish to cover 90 markets in terms of uh, transmitting business to business payment services. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to send money to 90 countries through Visa's blockchain. Uh, Unilever uh, managing its tea supply chain, tracking all the transactions in the train, as well as tracking all the suppliers in order to maintain quality. Absolutely critical and uh, the very much the best way to do it. Uh, DHL working is working on a proof of uh, concept with Accenture to track pharmaceuticals from point of origin to the point of origin to the consumer. Um, and British Airways uh, is working with a startup company called VChain to streamline its security purpose, uh, processes. Apparently, uh, BA security processes at the moment actually even end up delaying flights. They can't get the flights off the gate in time because of the security processes. So they're looking to use blockchain to streamline that and uh, improve their punctuality record. So, yeah, and there's lots of other companies and, rec and names you'll recognize there, Shell, Siemens, AIG, Prudential, you name it, they're all there and they are already using blockchain. They may not be uh, making a lot of noise about it and trumpeting it out there, um, but why, you know, this has got to show you the, the, the way forward or the, or the way the wind is blowing. Um, this slide is a bit complex, so I apologize for that um, in terms of its concept. Um, 
it's based on the fact that the user always prefers basically to be in control of what they're doing if they possibly can. Um, and generally, unless you're buying a Rolex or um, a Bugatti Veyron or something, you're generally looking to um, maximize what you get for your money. And so, so you doesn't necessarily mean you want to buy something cheap, but you want to make sure you're getting good value. So minimizing spend. Um, and we compromise on those because, because it's difficult uh, sometimes to do that. So we, if it's difficult to, if processing uh, overheads are very high, uh, we might centralize that processing rather than distributing it to our own desktops or phones or, or whatever. Um, if the um, trust level is not high enough, we might again want to use central um, uh, facilities to, uh, to provide that trust. So if the blockchain provides more trust um, and uh, can provide uh, a lower uh, or an easier way of processing transactions, then the future is the blockchain. At the moment, what's holding the blockchain back is it's very, very high processing overheads. Uh, the banks and clearing entities, however, will find it difficult, much more difficult to get into that um, uh, top right hand box unless they uh, also embrace uh, blockchain and become uh, full, fully uh, uh, users of it. So that's basically what, what this is saying is that um, the blockchain provides an alternative to using those clearing uh, entities. And uh, as we already said, 20 billion pounds in the UK economy is, uh, is, being, um, um, is being spent on clearing. So, uh, you know, that's 20 billion pounds that we can put back into buying, um, I don't know, spend it on golf or um, um, aviation fuel or whatever it is that, uh, that, that you fancy. Um, so, uh, where are we? Um, yes, conclusions and implications. So there was a lot of numbers and stuff in there, but just trying to sort of bring it down to a sort of simple message is um, the cryptocurrencies are definitely, you know, that they're the newsworthy ones. You don't hear so much about blockchain in, on, in the news or uh, in the Sun newspaper or uh, on the BBC. You hear a lot about the price of Bitcoin and uh, whether Elon Musk is accepting Bitcoin for testers and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the real game changer, in my view, is the blockchain. It has the potential to remove pretty much all the friction from peer-to-peer -peer transactions, um, enabling us all to learn from, uh, to earn from our assets. Um, anything that involves syndicating assets, provenance, supply chain management is fair game for blockchain. But just some sort of potential sort of these these will probably be trivial examples in the in the future. But you know, um, if if you're using Airbnb to rent out a spare bedroom in your house to holidaymakers, if you're lucky enough to live in the southwest like I do, then um, you know you're paying you know 15, 20, 30 percent of your of your income back to Airbnb. You could you could avoid doing that. Um, I'd be surprised if you use your car more than 10% of the time. 90% of the time is sitting on the drive or in your garage or on the road outside. Um, if you only had to buy a car for 10% of the time, or you could uh, earn money on it on the other 90% of the time, then you know it would make the economics of car ownership very different. Um, any selling and buying of goods and any syndicate ownership is uh, is 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 fair game. For the blockchain and heavy processing overheads are the current limit but technology improvements uh the um and and the new mechanisms such as uh, the um, proof of stake as opposed to proof of work blockchains uh, can help to ameliorate that problem um, and blockchain does have the potential to facilitate a quantum increase in the transaction density of society i apologize for just reading that out uh, <laughs> and if it does that, it will generate wealth and opportunities, but there will be disintermediation and there will be companies who make their money from clearing, who own assets um, and uh, charge commissions and so on, who will find that uh, they don't have any lunch anymore. So um, what should you be doing now? Well, you could invest or trade in cryptocurrencies. You could do that. You could make a fortune or you could lose the lot, uh, whether or not the... Um, there, there may be there may be other step increases in the future as um, as uh, blockchain changes and uh, new cryptocurrencies come to market that are more um, 
more palatable to the banks and so on. So there could be uh, there could be big growth there. But of course, uh, you know, you don't you can trade in Bitcoin now. It doesn't have to be illegal. You don't have to buy um, uh, drugs on the Silk Road or whatever. You can uh, uh, and you can declare your earnings. You don't have to not declare them. Um, and while several companies do accept Bitcoin, Bitcoin in the UK, that's actually less than it used to be um, because the massive value fluctuations are actually discouraging some retailers uh, and possibly they found that there weren't that many people who wanted to spend uh, cryptocurrency like cash. They were investing in cryptocurrency either for dark purposes or for investment purposes. Um, you could trade illegally. Like, you know, there's nothing to stop you doing that, um, but uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and I'll go on record as not recommending it in the recording. <laughs> um, so it's not really unhackable. Uh, nothing is really unhackable. And I would be amazed if there aren't at least half a dozen security services around the world that can already decrypt the blockchain um, for Bitcoin and know exactly who's done what to who and how much they spent. Uh, but they're keeping it quiet because it's more useful to them if the people that are doing the trading don't know that they're being observed. Uh, there are many historical um, uh, instances of that being how, uh, how governments choose to act. They don't reveal how much they know. Um, the enigma being a, a, a particular UK example, for example. Um, but what you should be doing is ensuring you're ready for the blockchain economy. I said earlier that it's going to be uh, 2025. Um, for the uh, for, for being adopted at scale um amazon has just been rumored as uh, being accept, uh, accepting of um of cryptocurrencies by the end of 21 which actually did result in a huge increase they've now denied that and uh, gone back but they're going to you know it's going to happen they're looking at it um and um Yes, just the rumor that Amazon was going to accept crypto increased average values of cryptocurrency by 15%. Uh, it pretty much all disappeared again after they uh, after they said that they weren't going to do it. But um, it's about how it impacts your business. It's not the cryptocurrency, it's the blockchain. How does the blockchain impact your value proposition? If your value proposition, if you're an estate agent, a lawyer, a, a doctor, uh, you, you name it, um, you need to look at how your value proposition is being presented to uh, to other customers because if you're acting as a middle person and a mediator then you do stand to be disintermediated but on the other hand um, where you add value it means you could potentially take that to a much wider audience um, so you know and uh, and the cost of you doing that might be much lower so market entry could be much, much, much simpler. Um, so think about how to enter the world of blockchain, research and understand it. But most of all, be agile, unprepared to change direction at a moment's notice. Things will happen quickly. As soon as you see something and that doesn't fit with what your expectations, you need to be thinking, how does that impact me? How does that affect me? And I wanted to just um, leave you with, I uh, apologize for this in advance, uh, a, a bit from the um, Monty Python. Uh, if anybody remembers, I'm not going to do uh, a John Cleese voice, um, but uh, the uh, leader of the People's Front of Judea said, what have, what have the Romans done for us? And you can read for yourself the things that the Romans did for us. And I'm saying that uh, a future reg, um, maybe for the uh, People's Front for um, clearing banks or something, uh, would say, um, apart from the security systems, privacy, protection, distributed ledgers, and friction-free transfer transactions, the true sharing economy in a cash-free society, what has the blockchain ever done for us? Um, you know, everybody could be 15 to 30% better off uh, than they are currently. Um, and that was a number I did actually calculate. I said, uh, if um, based on the numbers we've had previously, uh, the average UK household spend per year is um, about £30,571 per year. About £350 would be clearing costs. Around £8,254 would be spent on recreation, culture, hotels and restaurants. And around £5,000 on cars, uh, 3100 per car. Average 1.6 cars per household, 2.4 people per household. Those are sort of numbers. But that what that equates to is 15 to 30% better off if we're not paying commissions, paying commissions or clearing charges, and we can purchase only what we need, 
we just use a car when we want it. Uh, we don't we don't have to own a car and pay for its MOT every year and um, have it sitting outside being um, scratched and keyed and stuff. Um, and you know, and we're not going to get mugged because you know the the, the blockchain is so uh, personal uh, identity is so ingrained and baked into blockchain that uh, no one's going to steal steal your card for you because they probably won't be able to use it um so who could possibly want that who could possibly want a future society where which is everybody's more affluent uh, you can do more with less and you don't get knocked on the head leaving an atm so that's um that's really uh, as far as i've got with that there's um uh, time i think for some discussion at this stage of the game if anybody's got any questions i know martin you said you've uh, you've got some uh, questions as well so uh, i don't know i'll let you uh, i'll pass back yeah, to you yeah. i'll i'll turn off the screen sharing and um we can uh, i'll let you uh, moderate the session yeah, thank, you. thank you very much for that uh, Jonathan, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, a, a, a good history lesson, but also uh, some good perspective there on, on where, on what we should be looking at. And, uh, and actually, the, you know, with the tipping point for this being just around the corner, it's, uh, it, it's, it's certainly uh, starting to creep onto people's agendas, I think. Um, any, any questions from anybody uh, on this Zoom at the moment? I don't have anything in the chat. Uh, I'll just give you a second or two. Um, I've got uh, I've got three or four actually that have been submitted um, by people who couldn't make the call today. Um, so I will tackle those if, if, if that's all right. Obviously, feel free if uh, if you want to add or, or or you want Jonathan to add to any of this, then feel free. Um, so the first one I've got is is how do I get started using blockchain? Right. Okay. Um... The, okay, there's a there's a there's an eight step process. <laughs> um, so the first thing to do is to identify what your use case is. So you need to know what you're going to do with the blockchain, um, and you need to look at um, what your um, data authentication and verification needs are, um, smart asset management, smart contracts, all those sorts of things. So what is what, what you you know you need to have a plan. What are you going to do with it, and then you then need to think about what your best consensus um, mechanism is. So is it proof of work? Is it proof of stake? Um, how, you know, what's the, what's the basic architecture of the blockchain uh, you, you, you need? Once you've done that, you can then move to step three, which is to identify your platform. Most blockchain platforms are actually um, free and uh, open source at this stage of the game. So um, I'm not sure that will remain true uh, long into the future, but at the moment you, you've got a pretty wide selection of uh, blockchains that you can uh, jump onto. Once you've selected your platform, then you've got to design your uh, your, your sort of node structure. Um, is it going to be uh, permissioned or non-permissioned? There are basically two types of blockchain. If you can have a, a, a permissioned one, you can only basically be on it by invitation from the from the owner. Um, if you're, it's a non-permissioned one, and like uh, like uh, Bitcoin is, um, then anybody can participate. Um, and uh, whether or not uh, you know how, where the data is stored and all those sorts of things, then you've got to design your your what they call your instance configuration. Uh, what's included, what it does, um, basically a, a specification for the system. Uh, and then the next stage, number six, where it's number six already, is build the APIs, the application program interfaces, um, and uh, then go on to step step seven, which is design the admin and user interface. Uh, then step eight, which I think probably is, is really part of six and seven as well, is to add uh, technology like uh, artificial intelligence and bots and um, Internet of Things and stuff and make sure all that sort of future technology so that your uh, so that your application is um, is future proofed. And uh, once you've been through those uh, eight steps, you've got to, you know, you've got world domination within your grasp. <laughs> nice. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it, it's probably linked to this. Uh, and I suppose, I mean, you've advised loads of organizations on, on adopting different types of technology, but I, I've got how do I know I'll need blockchain in the future? I guess um, I guess okay. it depends on, on what sort of sector you're in and all that kind of stuff. But is it just around the corner? Um, I suppose at what, what stage do you leap? I guess. 
Yeah, it's not. Um, it, it's one of those. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not entirely objective here. I will. I will say. You know, my belief is you will need blockchain. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know. So. So I think. Uh, you know. I, I don't think it's a choice. I think that. Uh, you know. Sorry. There are. There are choices. If you want to be an artisanal. Um, producer of I don't know what was the example uh, yeah like um you know handcrafted uh, sailing boats that you're going to sell off the end of the slip to uh, to people in the town that you live in or whatever then you may not need blockchain in that circumstance but even if you're an artisanal cheese cheese producer you're probably going to need blockchain for um for marketing and uh, you know value chain management and so on um and if you want to be available in all markets to your customers, then you're going to need the blockchain to reach those customers, some of those customers, because that's how they will be transacting. And some of your suppliers too will be transacting that way. So you might find that diff more difficulty uh, obtaining, uh, joining into a, you know, um, like, um, you know, the, the, the hub and spoke model of electronic document interchange, I'm revealing my age here again, you know, was was forced by the big companies that wanted to move to just in time manufacturing. So they basically said to all the component manufacturers, you need to adopt this technology. And the same will happen with the blockchain. You will have large players who have a large amount of market power and say, we're doing it this way now. So you either join in or we don't work with you. Um, you know, so so, yeah, I don't I don't think it's a choice. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, we've got a few advisors on, on, on this call, and I suppose uh, us as, a, as an agency ourselves, we've certainly got a different view on it, having heard what you've got to say with the sort of ine inevitability of it. So um, I suppose what, any other, any other um, advice for, for advisors on, on helping to educate their, their, their clients and, uh, and the networks, and also um, maybe you know, what, what websites are useful for that perhaps? Yeah, um, yeah. I think um, do your research. I think is the is is the is the sort of main point. Um, you know, you can, you know, there are there are any number of websites out there that uh, um, I I quite like the content on Forbes.com. Um, PwC has some fairly interesting, and they did a did a sort of major blockchain piece in October uh, last year. Um, there's um, uh, there's blockchain 101 which um, is actually trying to sell you courses on how to be a blockchain developer uh, but it has an awful lot of background material in there about um, uh, that sort of stuff uh, coin desk and finance and um, so on and so forth all of these all of these places are good places to start if you want to if you want to get a handle on things there's a there's a ton of information i i, I would sort of tend to stay away from the the, the, the mainstream press in a sense that in, in, in forming opinions simply because they're, you know, they, they've got their axe to grind. They want to sort of say, oh, you know, Bitcoin lost 40% of its value last Thursday because somebody sneezed, you know, and, 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 and they're trying to dramatize everything. Um, and, and they're um, depressingly low um, news integrity <laughs> levels um but uh, but there's lots of good stuff out there from the website you there are also you know again it's caveat emptor you have to look but there are lots of consultancies out there that are that will help you uh, get into blockchain um or assess your need uh, i think it, it is a bit like uh, you know if you uh, if you take your wheels to the um uh, you know, your, your car to the um uh, garage and ask them to balance the take advantage of their free free uh, wheel alignment check they're going to find out that you need to have them aligned <laughs> and charge you for that uh, yeah, similarly. Yeah. so if you go to a blockchain consultant and say do i need one the answer is going to be yes so i think you know you need to um you need to be um understanding of of, of just really what the what the height of the tsunami is and how close it is because yeah, it's sure. it's going to come um and those that aren't prepared for it at all will suffer um, yeah. look, massive losses as a, as a result of not not being ready for it. And it's not necessarily that you would have to do very much. You don't necessarily you don't have to invent your own cryptocurrency. You don't have to have your own blockchain. You might just have to be prepared to participate in other people's blockchains. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know. But you know, if you don't, if you if you shut your eyes and say no, no, it's not. It doesn't doesn't apply to me. Twenty twenty five scale adoption. 
of that yeah. you know so by 2023 2024 you know it's already going to be impacting your business um and by 2025 if you haven't done anything you might be too late i think i think linked i think linked to that very interestingly we've got um we've got uh, something in the chat from from david afton who's saying you know great webinar really useful uh, suddenly feels 10 years older I get that. <laughs> uh, his question is what what would an average guy on the street need to take away from this? And I guess that's, I suppose that's linked to the sort of trivialization of it. It's a bit frustrating, isn't it? In, in, yeah. in sort of media. So, um, well, I would, I would, I would tend to ignore most of the talk about cryptocurrency. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I think that it, 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 give a dog a bad name, you know, that, that Bitcoin is always going to be associated with, um, you know, illicit transactions and, uh, fast losses and gains um but you know ethereum is a much more is a much more um high integrity product in a sense you know and um so there are there are cryptos out there that are that are much more um business oriented and much less flashy shall we say um but i so i think that i you know i, I would tend to stay away from uh, and personally i I will tell you, I haven't uh, invested in any cryptocurrency myself, uh, which is a shame because if I'd done it uh, five years ago when I would, I probably wouldn't have to be doing this webinar now. I'd be sitting on my yacht somewhere. <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, but uh, the, um, the, 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 the thing that the average business and the average person needs to take away is that is that blockchain isn't cryptocurrency. Blockchain is a methodology a technology that will support the way we do business in the future much like email replaced fax and um uh, lots of other communications posts and all those sorts of things you know the, the, the blockchain you, you might think of as the email of the fourth stroke fifth industrial revolution in a sense um and yeah. uh, you know if you think of it that way then you think well okay now i i again because i'm older than David Appleton, I'm sure, <laughs> um, that uh, I can remember my boss coming to me many years previously and saying, John, I, I need to install a network. Um, what, uh, you know, how can I business justify it? And I said, I have no idea. I don't know how you can business justify a network. I just know that if you do it, you know, it, it, it's all very, yeah. uh, going back even further into history, it's all very, um, well, what's the guy's name? Um, uh, Dances with Wolves, Kevin Costner, you know, build it and they will come. <laughs> you know, it is it is a bit like that. You know, you, you, you need to, you, it's going to happen and whether you like it or not. So you need to, you need to, you need to be there. You need to, you need to be in that game. It, think, of it, think of it as email. Okay, thanks for that, Jonathan. Apparently you're not much older than David Ashton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just well, well preserved. <laughs> any, any other, any other questions um from from those on, on on this call um sort of final final call for those um okay so um, i think we can we can we can wrap up there please okay. send in your feedback it'd be really useful um do let us know if there are any other um topics that you'd like uh, jonathan to cover um or whether you'd like a different angle on on, on some of this and maybe on the next steps obviously this gives you know more an introduction if you like um, so please do give us the, the feedback uh, when you can. Um, copies of the slides are available. If you just go to um, gjcadvisory.com, click on uh, Jonathan's um, profile, uh, and there'll be a link to his email there. If you want to get in touch with him, um, you can get in touch with him on that and, uh, and, and continue the conversation. Um, so that's it from us. Thank you all for joining. Um, hopefully you'll know a lot more about blockchain and crypto. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Right. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.